Good evening, Section Z. Tonight we're going to start looking at Chapter 8 of the Duke Premier text on title insurance. So let me share with you the beginning of that chapter. So the authors say that in this chapter we deal with the system our country has developed to assure purchasers of land that they have good title to the land purchased. I want to stop for a second and think about why that is important. Um, and I want to do that in part by sharing a short video clip with uh, an interview with a Peruvian economist named Hernando de Soto, who is uh, a very famous economist, a developmental economist, who talks a lot about um, overcoming poverty, poverty and the use of markets to do that. Uh, and one of the points that he makes is that uh, in developing countries, there are lots of people who have land use rights that are recognized by their neighbors. They're kind of informally viewed as property owners and everybody acknowledges uh, that they have the right to use their property. But where there is not a kind of a formal recognition of those property rights and a definition of them that allows the person to sell them or transfer them or uh, effectively take advantage of a real estate market. Um, and the result is that people have a lot of potential value in property that they, in a sense, own. And yet without a functioning system of property law that gives formal property rights, they aren't able to tap into a lot of that value. Um, and so, for example, somebody has a home, but it's hard for them to borrow money um, using the home as security unless you have a good system of property rights. And that's what this chapter is about in part, um, about how our country has developed a system to give people assurance that they have good title to property when they buy it um, and that they will have certain rights in that property when they do. Um, so let me stop sharing this and move to the Hernando de Soto interview. This is about four minutes from when he was interviewed at the Oslo Freedom Forum a few years back. And you discussed the time loss in an informal economy. Talk to me about capital loss. What is dead capital? Well, dead capital is when whatever you own is only the physical value of what you own. In other words, in the United States, you own a house. But you can do a whole bunch of things with a house. That house, first of all, is a point on the map. It's an address, which tells the electricity company that's, or that's distributing the electricity that they not only know where your house is, it's a terminal for their wire, but it's also the place that is owned by somebody who's responsible for paying the bill. Therefore, the electrical company will come and give you the electricity because they know that they can collect. The biggest problem about distributing electricity or clean water is not whether uh, you know where to go. The real problem is, are they going to pay for it? And when it comes to clean water, they won't also they also won't go because collecting is so difficult. So actually, if you're informal, you won't have, therefore, the tubes bringing in the clean water or the sewage coming out. You'll have to buy the water from uh, tanks, uh, trucks with tanks on them. That'll cost you six times more than if you had a tube. And all of that because you didn't have an address, and you don't have an address because your property is not legal. So the concept, so if you start having a house, all of a sudden utilities start working for you. The price of electricity goes down. The price of water goes down. And at the same time, since you don't have to go to town meetings and get together with everybody so that if somebody ever wants to evict you, you're strong, you're talking about 10,000 people, 20,000, maybe a million, and you just won't take it anymore. Uh, to do that, you've got to be politically active. That takes an awful lot of time. So there you are, a lot of dead capital, meaning that your house, instead of giving you more income, giving you more comfort, actually takes away time, takes away comfort, and everything is more expensive. One of the principal uh, elements 
difference also if you have an illegal home or an informal home is that since you cannot certify that you are the owner, you therefore can't get a mortgage. And uh, you can't use it to guarantee credit the way you could if it were legal. It's not that people won't give you credit, it's that they'll make it much more expensive. Uh, at the same time, uh, you can't use it as a contribution for capital. Um, and so you're not able to use it to make an investment. Some people will say, I'll give as a guarantee for the shares that I need in this company, my home. And at the same time, of course, from the point of view of government, uh, since they don't know who really is in the house, they don't know if Osama bin Laden or Abimael Guzman or an agent of Fidel Castro is in the house. You also can't, the police can't work without addresses. If you look at any of your police films in the United States, they're going from one address to another address to another address until they catch the bad guy. Well, you're not going to get that if you don't have property rights because property rights are the precursor to addresses. So that is dead capital. In other words, the fact that you're legal puts so much information on paper, on documents, on records that is fed to other people, that gives them security, that all sorts of good things start happening. So dead capital is all of that value, that surplus value that is additional to the bricks, the mortar, the iron that's in your house, which you're not getting. How do you think? So that's a little bit of economic background about why uh, the recording system in this country is so important because that is a means that we use to give people security about ownership of property rights and then that gives them the ability to access credit and, and use their home in various ways. Um, so the authors talk about the recording system. Um, one point to recognize here is that uh, a deed does not have to be recorded in order to be legally effective. Um, a deed is valid, it's good, as between the grantor and grantee when it's delivered. It doesn't have to be recorded to be valid between the parties. Um, and so then that raises a question of why we have a recording system. Um, and really it has to do with the protection of interests of other people. Um, it allows other people to determine who owns land. Um, it allows protection of purchasers of land against unrecorded documents that might uh, interfere with their ability to acquire and use it. Now, recording acts generally require that a deed is acknowledged before a notary public before it can be recorded. I don't know if you all are familiar with notarization, but there are various documents that you may have had to have had notarized before. But there are people in this, uh, this country who are notaries public and they have uh, a license from the state and that allows them to kind of uh, take acknowledgements and to kind of verify people's signatures. And so if I have a deed and I want it notarized, then I take the deed and I show it to a notary public and then I show them my signature and I give them my driver's license and they, they can verify that I am in fact the person whose signature appears on that line and then they will place a stamp on the document indicating that it's been notarized. That has to happen um, if you want to record a deed in the recording system. Uh, in, in pretty much in this country. Um, now, it's possible you could have a deed that was valid between the parties, but could not be recorded because it had not been notarized. Um, and so that then raises the question of, well, if you've got these valid deeds out there that can't be recorded, um, do they really, uh, does the recording system kind of uh, fall down? Or is there a way to kind of get notice of that deed on the records so that it provides notice to other purchasers or potential purchasers of interest in the property. Um, and there are different ways that you could get an unnotarized deed reflected in the records of, uh, of the county recording system. Um, so for instance, um, you could obtain some kind of a judgment, say a declaratory judgment that acknowledges you as the owner of a piece of land and then you might be able to record that judgment even if you couldn't record the underlying deed that resulted in that judgment. Um, or the authors note on page 416 that 
about a third of the states have a statute that allows you to record an affidavit. So you can make an affidavit, a kind of a sworn statement under oath that states certain facts relating to the title, and you might be able to use that affidavit to get evidence of an unrecordable deed into the county land records. Um, another term that you're gonna see coming up in this material that, uh, that will be important is Liz Pendens, L-I-S, P-E-N-D-E-N-S. And basically that's just uh, something that you put on the record to give notice of litigation that could affect Title II or interests in the property. And so um, you, nothing's been adjudicated yet, but you just want people to know that there's a lawsuit that could affect who owns this property and to take that into account in making decisions about uh, purchasing and the like. So um, if you did not have a recording statute, and you had two people that had both purported this by the same piece of land, um, who would win at common law? Well, common law, the view was that the first in time automatically would win. That if somebody sold a piece of land, then they no longer had title, and therefore they could not sell it again to somebody else. So the second person was just out of luck. They bought a piece of land from somebody who didn't own it. Um, the recording statute gives at least a potential way to reverse that common law rule. In other words, this provides a way that the person who is second in time could prevail over the person who was first in time by virtue of the recording statutes. Um, so one important idea when you're talking about recording statutes is a title search. And on page 417 of the book, the authors spend a lot of time talking about how you would do a typical title search to try and find uh, documents affecting interests in a particular piece of property. Um, they talk about using grantor and grantee indexes. Um, grantor indexes are just kind of indexes in the recording system that list uh, documents by the name of the grantor and similarly, grantee indexes list documents by the name of the grantee. Um, and so what you do is you kind of, you go back in time uh, using the grantee indexes until you find what the authors call a root of title, something far enough in the past that you think is uh, a good enough starting point. Uh, and then once you have gone back in the grantee indexes, then you search forward in the grantor indexes, uh, looking for uh, you know, some indication that some grantor uh, in your chain of title uh, might have given out some other interest in the property before the document that you're relying upon uh, in the chain of title. Um, so we've got some books that, uh, or some cases that kind of deal with recording statutes. First one is Luthi versus Evans on page 420. Um, here we've got Grace Owens, who owns some interests in oil and gas leases. Um, and in February of 1971, she uh, signs a deed, an instrument, that assigns her interest in certain oil and gas leases to International Tours Incorporated. Um, the case is about a lease called the Kufal lease. Um, it was... The, the deed that was signed in February of 1971 listed seven leases and described them with specificity. It did not list the Kufal lease as one of the ones that were specifically called out, but it contained a clause that the court calls a Mother Hubbard clause um, that says basically that the grantors, the assignors, were intended to convey uh, all interests they had in all oil and gas leases in Coffee County, Kansas. And so that general description was enough to pick up the Kufal lease. Um, and so uh, the court acknowledges that as between the original parties, as between Owens and International Tours, the Kufal lease uh, was transferred to Tours. That, that deed was sufficient to transfer the interest in the Kufal lease to Tours. Um, but then Owens goes on and executes a second document in January of 1975. This one is specific to the Gafal lease and transfers her interest in that lease to the uh, defendant named Burris. Um, and so the issue in the case is whether Burris had notice when he purchased from Owens 
that Owens had actually already assigned the Kofal lease or her interest, uh, his interest in Kofal lease to somebody else before Burris bought it. Um, so he says that he, he himself went to the recordings uh, office and he didn't find the 1971 assignment. Uh, he says he had a title search done uh, and that was uh, not uh, able to disclose the 1971 assignments. Um, so it's possible though that even if you um, go and actually look for a deed and don't find it, um, that you still could be deemed to have notice. So an important idea under the recording statutes is this idea of constructive notice. That even if you don't actually find a document relevant to land titles, you will be deemed to have found it. You will be deemed to have constructive notice if a proper title search would have located that document. And so a lot of these cases come down to questions of, well, what should we expect of a title search? What should a title search look like? And that's a question that varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. It's not gonna be the same everywhere. Um, and so here, uh, Burris, um, it, it's argued that Burris should have found the evidence of the Kafal lease because of this assignment in 1971. They had this Mother Hubbard clause that said it was covering all of Owen's interest in oil and gas leases in Coffey County. And if he'd found that document, then he could have found out that, she, uh, that Owens had already transferred the, uh, the interest in the Kafal lease. Um, the court, though, decides that uh, the 1971 assignment did not give constructive notice to Burris. It's not something that should have been picked up in a title search. Um, and basically the reasoning is that if you look at the statutes in Kansas dealing with recording, uh, it's clear that they think that those statutes are designed to get you to describe the land that you're conveying with specificity. Um, the tours assignment in this case was listed in the index um, and it listed in the index the seven tracks that were specifically described, but of course it didn't say anything about the Kafal lease, and so a title searcher who sees a reference to that document in the index isn't gonna think to go look at it uh, and find out whether there's some general clause that might cover other property that was not mentioned in the index. Now, what if Burris, in the course of going down the courthouse, had actually located the assignment to tours and had read it and found out that it had this Mother Hubbard clause. Um, well, in that case, um, then tours might prevail over Burris because Burris has actual knowledge that there was a prior transfer of the Kafal lease. Um, and then the other question is what if tours had noticed that they had purchased an interest in a lease that wasn't specifically mentioned in the deed from Owens? Could they have done anything about that? Um, and they could have uh, potentially filed an affidavit or some other instrument or document that identified the Kufal lease specifically and made sure it was in the recording uh, system in a way that it could be picked up by title searches. Second case having to do with uh, title searches uh, and what title searches should be expected to find, or versus buyers on page 427. Um, the relationship between Orr and Elliot here is that Orr is a judgment creditor, Elliot is a judgment debtor. Elliot owes $50,000 to Orr because of the outcome of some lawsuit resulting in a $50,000 judgment. Now, after Orr gets the judgment against Elliot, he has his attorney prepare something called an abstract of, of judgment, basically a document explaining the existence of this $50,000 judgment that is then uh, recorded in the recording system. Uh, and the idea is that you want to have a lien against any property owned by the debtor in that county uh, to enforce your judgment. You wanna make sure that they don't sell property without paying off your judgment. And so you wanna lien against the property um, and the abstract of judgment in the recording system is supposed to accomplish that. Um, now, if a judgment debtor sells a piece of property that has a judgment lien attached to it, then the judgment lien goes with the property into the hands of the buyer. The buyer has to satisfy the judgment debt because that piece of land, once the lien attaches, is security for the payment of that judgment. So in this case, Elliot sells his property uh, to somebody appropriately named Rick Byers. Sounds like a 
law school hypothetical in July 1979, um, the judgment lien or the abstract of judgment had actually been recorded um, you know, eight, nine months earlier in November of 1978. Um, when buyers purchased the property, he had a title search performed, but the title searcher didn't come across this abstract of judgment reflecting the judgment, uh, uh, the money owed to Orr. Um, and the reason is that Orr's attorneys had misspelled Elliot's name in the judgment, in the abstract of judgment itself, um, and in the, the actual judgment document. So in the judgment, uh, they had used one T instead of two. In the abstract of judgment, they'd used one T and one L. Um, and in fact, Elliot's real name was spelled with two L's and two T's. So Orr files this action against buyers and the person who purchased from buyers, um, and he wants to foreclose on the judgment lien. Um, notice note three on page 427, that uh, Orr actually is not any longer a party to the lawsuit. Um, the foreclosure remedy is now being pursued by Orr's attorneys, who apparently had to pay Orr in a malpractice action for having misfiled the, the uh, abstract of judgment, um, and so now the attorneys have stepped into Orr's place and are trying to enforce Orr's rights uh, to foreclose on the lien. So, buyers and his successors argue that they are not subject to this judgment lien because they have a status that is important under the reporting statutes. They are good faith purchasers for value without notice, or you'll also see the phrase bona fide purchasers for value without notice. Um, or says, well, uh, they had uh, constructive notice. They should have known about this abstract of judgment. If they had done a proper title search, their title searcher would have found this document. And so they should be deemed to have notice, even though they claim they didn't know about the judgment. Um, and so the question then becomes, well, should the title searcher have found this abstract of judgment with the misspelled names in it? Um, and the, uh, or argues that the title searcher should have looked for alternative spellings of the name Elliot because of this doctrine found in some of the case law called Edom Sonens. Um, so apparently there is such a doctrine that is applied in certain cases relating to real property, um, applied to issues of like sameness of identity. So for instance, if there had been a deed that said the grantee is William Elliot, 1L1T, well, you might be able to rely upon the Edom Sonnen's doctrine to prove that, well, it really meant William Elliot, 2Ls, two 2Ts, two uh, to show that this is the same person uh, that is mentioned in the document, even though the name was misspelled. Um, but the question for the court here is, well, does that doctrine apply to title searchers? Do they have to look under alternative searchers, uh, ser uh, name spellings of, uh, of the name of one of the parties. Um, and the court here says, no, that's not required. They uh, disagree with a Missouri decision called Green, which said that Edom Sonnens did apply to title searches. Um, I suspect that the reason the court came out the way it did is that title searching is potentially difficult and expensive, and this would have made it significantly more expensive and difficult in a large urban area with lots and lots of documents being recorded. Um, that in this case, there was actually uh, an easier way to avoid the problem, which is that Orr's attorney could have just been more careful and spelled the name right uh, before recording the abstract of judgment. So take a look at page 430. Let me get down there just a second oops i gotta share my screen with you before that's gonna work i'm still learning my way around zoom but we will figure this thing out okay so let me try sharing this with you all right and let me see if i can get down to page 430 All right, so the notes and the problems. Um, note two questions there, first paragraph. Um, Elizabeth Taylor owns Whiteacre and the record title is in her name. Elizabeth marries Eddie Fisher and gives a mortgage on Whiteacre to Carol Burnett, signing the mortgage Elizabeth Taylor Fisher. 
This mortgage is indexed under the name of Fisher. Subsequently, Elizabeth divorces Eddie, resumes her maiden name, and sells Whiteacre to Adam Sandler, signing the deed Elizabeth Taylor. Sandler has no actual notice of the Burnett mortgage. In a jurisdiction where indexing is part of the record, does Sandler prevail over Burnett? Well, arguably here, Sandler wouldn't have any notice uh, of this mortgage to Burnett because it's indexed under the name Fisher, and that's not a name that is connected to the chain of title in any way. Now, the result might be different if there was something to put the title searcher on notice that uh, Taylor had been married and had previously used the name of Fisher, but if there's nothing to connect that name to this piece of land, then, uh, then probably not. Then the second paragraph. Um, suppose that Elizabeth had signed the mortgage Elizabeth Taylor Fisher uh, and that the mortgage had been indexed under the name of Taylor Fisher. Would this indexing have give constructive notice to Sandler? Um, notice the case with the parenthetical holding that uh, the hyphenated name didn't give notice to protect an unhyphenated version of the name. Um, and then finally, the third paragraph, um, suppose that after the divorce and before the conveyance to Sandler, Taylor's landlord had obtained a judgment against Betty Taylor, DBA Betty Taylor Jewelry. Um, the name was used in the judgment because the lease was signed that way. The judgment created a lien on all Taylor's pop property and the judgment was filed and indexed under the name of Betty Taylor. Um, and so the question is, does Sandler's title examiner uh, have to search for the name Betty Taylor uh, rather than the more formal Elizabeth Taylor um, and here they give you a case uh, called uh, J.I. case uh, where the court decided that somebody whose name was William Franklin Barton, um, the title searcher should have found a document, a judgment against Bill Barton. Uh, and so uh, at least there's some precedent suggesting that diminutives of a name should also be searched. So. Uh, that is enough for this first lecture. We will go into types of recording statutes in our next lecture, but uh, uh, good evening and talk to you later.